Hello, I'm Bill Goodman, Executive Director of Kentucky Humanities. Welcome to this edition of Six at Six called Democracy and the Free Press. We're pleased you've taken time to join us for this Democracy and the Informed Citizen event that brings attention to the essential link between the humanities and photojournalism. This conversation is made possible with the generous support of our partners, including the Northern Kentucky University Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement, the Federation of State Humanities Councils, and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. At Kentucky Humanities, we're celebrating a milestone, our 50th anniversary, and we'd like to share with you some of our most impactful programs we've produced and supported over the past 50 years. Enjoy the video, followed by Democracy and the Press. What is your favorite Kentucky story? Is it a story from the past, told through the words of those who lived it? Or is it a story of today, bringing together the ideas and hopes of friends and neighbors? Maybe it's a story that dances in your mind from the pages of a book. Or a story shared between parent and child. The story might come to life through voices shared in song. It can even be a story without words, told through the sweeping power of images in film. Through the governor of Kentucky is a woman. Or the bright ring of a banjo across the open air. In Kentucky, stories are the lanterns of humanity, drawing us together and guiding us across time and place. It's a journey that leads to inspiration, meaningful discourse, and an appreciation for each other. Kentucky Humanities has shared this journey with Kentuckians for half a century. That makes 2022 both a time to look back and a time to look forward. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Mark Nykirk, the director of the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement, and thanks for being with us, and thanks for your patience this evening, patience with those of you who are with us in person as well as those who are with us online. There are a lot of technical pieces to tonight's uh, presentation. Turns out that hybrid events are a little harder than if you just did a Zoom event or if you just did an in-person event, but uh, so bear with us. We're working through, through all this, uh, but those of you who are with us in person, we also have a video uh, audience who's with us here live uh, tonight also. So welcome if you're out there in the Zoom world uh, to the NKU campus. Uh, I direct the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement here on campus, which connects uh, the community to the campus in a variety of ways. And one of those ways is with a lecture series every year called Six at Six. That's because there's six of them and they're at six o'clock. And for the past 15 years, we've had the privilege of having a an Associated Press journalist with us once a year, and this year we have uh, three. So uh, it's kind of a special night, and I appreciate the uh, partnership with AP. We also have a partnership with, uh, for tonight's lecture with Kentucky Humanities, which is focusing on democracy and the citizen's voice uh, this year uh, with uh, forums uh, around the state of Kentucky. Uh, so tonight's uh, Six at Six is also a part of that. We are focusing this year on uh, democracy uh, and uh, different pieces of that uh, as we move through the year, uh, and tonight's is democracy and the uh, press. So uh, we uh, I just say, as everybody knows from uh, just watching the news that, uh, and uh, you know, from our history books, that democracy is rarely calm, and uh, sometimes comes with uh, its moments of unrest and. You will hear tonight uh, from uh, journalists who have been 
uh, covering that so that we know uh, what is uh, uh, going on uh, in, in the world. And of course, a lot of times it's those images that stay with us as much as uh, any text that is written. And uh, you're in, I think, uh, I'm not sure if treat's the right word because some of this is pretty uh, powerful uh, uh, and, and unfortunate images, but uh, uh, things we need to see. Uh, we uh, expected to have uh, three people with us in person, Julio Cortez, uh, and Julio, who you'll hear from in a bit, uh, is a Pulitzer Prize winner uh, for his work on the team that shot the aftermath of uh, the George Floyd killing. Uh, he is based in uh, Baltimore, uh, but is also sort of a, one of part of the AP team that travels to trouble spots wherever they arise. So uh, we think we're going to uh, keep you for the next 90 minutes at least before they summon you away. And uh, and Andrew uh, Harnick uh, is uh, based in D.C., spends a lot of time at the White House or uh, on uh, the road, so to speak, with whoever may be president. And uh, Kim Johnson Flooden is uh, unable to be with us. You'll see Kim here. She uh, got sick, uh, not COVID, but uh, unable to travel, so she's going to zoom in with us tonight. Uh, and that's been part of uh, what we've uh, been working on to get all the pieces uh, working. So uh, what we're going to do, uh, those of you in the uh, virtual audience, uh, there is a Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen. Type your question there. We will watch uh, for those and ask them uh, live here uh, at NKU. Those of you in the audience, when we get to the Q&A portion, uh, we'll have a mic to move around and please uh, use the mic because the virtual audience will want to hear you as uh, well. So uh, that's how that will work and I will try to remind the virtual audience from time to time that uh, we uh, welcome your questions uh, once we get to that uh, part. So uh, we're going to hear from uh, Kim first uh, and uh, then uh, from uh, Andrew and then from Julio, I think is the order we're going to go in and uh, then we'll move to uh, the questions and answers. So again, thank you for being with us and I think we are ready to bring Kim into the room. And Kim, I should say, uh, is based in Chicago and uh, directs a lot of uh, coverage, I think including the Minneapolis coverage. Uh, she was, uh, 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 when um, um, Julio's photo, for example, came in, that you, uh, the iconic photo that you'll see tonight of the uh, flag and the fire, uh, uh, it was Kim who was the photo editor who got that out quickly uh, uh, to the world and uh, on the front pages of newspapers. So, uh, yeah. so you pretty much told the story yet. My current, should I go ahead and start? Uh, yes, please. Okay, great. Um, hi, yeah, my name's Kim Johnson. I am currently the central deputy director of news gathering and photos and that means I work with uh, teammates across formats to uh, craft coverage of news events and sporting events and news stories and stories that emanate from breaking news. Um, my background is that I started off as a photographer. Um, I worked at the Sacramento Bee, the New Orleans Times Picayune, and then at the AP as a photographer and kind of evolved into an editor and took fewer and fewer pictures over time. Um, so my presence here is mostly to talk about how we work together to, to cover stories such as the one with Julio. Um, but I, I did have the uh, interesting experience of looking back over the photos that I've done before I became an editor. And uh, this, is, this is a great venue for me because there's so much about why I became a photojournalist. It all had to do with de democracy, giving people a voice, um, humanizing folks, uh, shining a light on things that, that don't get attention. Um, I, I consider it a bit of a public surface and I know it's kind of high-minded, but that's what I did. I was not a, 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 a camera geek, so. If you want to go ahead and, and start through the pictures, I'll just I'll just run through them really quickly because they're they're nothing in compared to what what Andy and um, sorry Andrew Andrew and Julio had. Um, this this is all very old school, but it's kind of representative of what I did. So there's my name. Let me go on to the next one. 
Oh, yes. So, like I said, I was very interested in social justice, and I was so privileged that while I was at the time Picayune, I was sent to South Africa to cover the first free elections. Um, so this is where, this was a line of people out trying to vote, and, you know, it's different from the U.S., where uh, there may not be a lot of literacy, so they had the photos in, of the candidates as well as the flags of the different parties that they represented. People just put their thumbprint. This one was left on the ground. And um, so I, I just made the picture to show people pictures. So there's that one. And next. And this is, uh, this was uh, some schoolgirls. And so this, you know, this is, before it's officially there's not apartheid, but so this shows uh, the, the segregation that exists in the schools. So we went to Soweto and, um, and documented some of the life there, and this is just daily life in Soweto. And I worked in Wichita, and this was during the time where there were a bunch of uh, protests at abortion clinics, and um, this you, know, you want to show all sides of stories, and in this one in particular, protesters who um, were in prayer in front of the police officers. They were trying not to be, well, just before they were going to be arrested. And this was a women's conference in Beijing. Um, this, this was, I believe, in 1996. This was a time where they were really focusing on it, women's issues, um, a micro businesses and how to build and help uh, underprivileged and women and women who don't have the same opportunities that they have in a lot of first world nations. And this were a bunch of women lining up to go into one of the conferences. Um, and long before we really experienced terrorism in the U.S., uh, I, as I worked at the Sacramento Bee, they were anticipating the concept of it, and we went to Europe. We went all over the world, but I went to, to London and um, North, North Ireland to cover how that's dealt with. And, and this is the entrance to the, in London, there's a city of London, it's like the subsidy, and it's a financial district. So in order to pass, to get in there, you would have to pass through this. This is all very common now in the U.S., but it was not something that, that we saw here. Um, it was it was there because they always had concerns about bombings. Next, now oh, this is just things. This was a tornado. Um, and there's not much in democracy there except for you have your government representatives there walking about to shoot the tornado. Sorry, I didn't delete that one out there. Okay, um, is there more? This is here in Chicago actually because I worked. I actually flew up. This was a time when there was a NATO conference, and then you had several people coming to protesting for all the various issues that the, that people have uh, worldwide when leaders come together. So the streets of Chicago was, were, was flooded with people in there representing their different issues. Oh, and this. So I when I started at the Associated Press, I started in Los Angeles, and. The antithesis of what I wanted to do, I did so many red carpets, but this particular one was the Oscars that um, were right when we went to war in 2003, and they had this austere Oscar where there was only like five people on the red carpet, and all of the celebrities came through, and we could actually talk to them, but this is Susan Sarandon and Tim Robbins, who were very politically active, and so this was their... This was their statement for democracy and against war, and that is why. That, that, that's probably the best that you're going to get out of Hollywood for, uh, for democracy. Okay, and so um, I, I'm not sure how much more you want to talk about, but I, I could say a little bit about what, what I did, um, as, an example with, with uh, Julio, and um, the team that went into Minneapolis, um, that we have, we have bureaus all over the world. And in Minneapolis, we have one photographer, and and this photographer was uh, could do a lot of daytime stuff. But like like was said earlier, that he was not equipped to cover 
these kinds of uprisings that happened. So Julio and John Mancello and eventually a whole group of people came into Minneapolis when things started getting out of hand. And we all hooked up on, on text and just worked together through the night to stay in contact about things um, through technology. We have these Sony cameras where they could transmit out of the cameras. So they would transmit to me, and at that time I was still in Dallas. I was sitting at my kitchen table and just sat up all night catching their pictures. And you know they would send me five or six of them out of a batch. And I would caption them, tweak them a little bit because the Tony was already really great, and push them out to the world to keep the story going in time. Because not only do we want to tell the story, but we, we want to be the first to tell it. We want to tell it right, we want to tell it accurately, we want to tell it compellingly. Um, and I can attest that these guys are beyond brave. They were inside of a burning precinct. And um, I was like, I think you need to leave. But they would stay until they made the best, most telling photos. They got on the roof of the precinct, and then Julio roamed down the street and made that amazing photo of that young man holding the flag upside down. Um, there was much more to the evening. They were they were shot out over over the different days with bullets by the police, um, attacked by some protesters or counter protesters. They had to evacuate their hotel because the fires that people were setting were like next door across the street. Um, and it's, it's a little odd to be so far away, but so much into the middle of it, but I just have nothing but the deepest admiration for the work that our photographers do. And um, just work and respect. And it's just, it's a privilege to work with them. Kim, if I could just ask you one uh, question before we in invite uh, Andrew. Uh, um, in the course of a, 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 an evening or several days where there are uh, things as there were in Minneapolis and really around the country uh, uh, for the uh, uh, protest, uh, you must see uh, hundreds of photographs and you're making quick decisions about which ones will uh, make the cut, so to speak, and go out on the wire. Could you talk about that process in general and particularly that process uh, uh, you made the decision, for example, to uh, uh, move the picture of the uh, uh, flag that we'll see in a bit. Yeah, well, I'm I'm looking for pictures that are s both storytelling and compelling. I mean, the the perfect photo for me is it's just it's just stunning and beautiful, and it, and it says something. Um, with with the one that for Julio, the the batch of photos came in. I saw it, and it was. But that one, I know there was one image where the kid was standing there, and then the next image, which I believe is the one I chose, he, he started walking and you could see the flag kind of fluttering. And it was, it, it's just, it was like little things, but to me it just, it said a whole lot more. And um, I remember writing it up and talking about the, the flag upside down, showing the sign of distress, fluttering in the, in the wake of this person walking down the street. And it just, when you match the words with with the photo, it just it said so you could see it, but then the words just really, I think, gives it that punch. And so uh, that that's how I look at it. Um, sometimes focus is an issue because they they can't see, they can't do critical focus when they when they're looking at the pictures and selecting them. Sometimes it's it's a little too crooked to straighten it out. You might mess something up. But in this case. It was all there. It was just really a matter of choosing which frame um, was super special as opposed to pretty damn special. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, stay with us. We're, uh, when we move to the Q&A, all three of our panelists will be available to answer questions. And I'm going to invite uh, Andrew up to speak. And uh, one thing I'll just say in terms of context is uh, on January the 6th, uh, Andrew was inside the Capitol and Julio outside, so you're going to get to hear both perspectives of that. All right.
Well, uh, thank you everybody for joining us and um, uh, thank you so much to uh, the Scripps Howard Center and uh, Northern Kentucky University for hosting the Associated Press. Um, and a special thanks to Felicia and, uh, and, uh, and Mark who uh, have been just a, extremely nice hosts taking us, giving us a tour uh, with uh, Kentucky today. Um, my name is Andrew Harnick. I'm a staff photographer with the Associated Press. Um, I'm based in Washington, D.C. Um, I'll just give you just a quick, um, for, for students listening, um, just a quick explanation of what, the, what a wire service is, like the Associated Press. Um, it's uh, the oldest uh, news organization in the world. It's founded in 1846. Uh, and it distributes uh, multimedia services to more than 120 company, uh, countries. And it provides um, articles, text, audio, and photography, and video. Um, so for instance, um, a uh, daily paper in, say, Kentucky, who wants to give, put their uh, resources into covering local news, and they want to cover uh, something in Washington, D.C., they use the Associated Press to um, basically, the way you would subscribe to a magazine or a newspaper yourself, the organization subscribes to the Associated Press, and in return they can get photography uh, from somebody who's um, dedicated to cover uh, you know, the president or something like that. Um, I'll just, uh, I, I want to keep this kind of fun and and, and try to sort of give you an idea of what not only our work is, but uh, kind of the, what the, the life involves. Um, there, was a, um, there, was a, there was a group uh, that did a little uh, short video, uh, maybe three years ago, um, just of what it's like sort of a day in the life of working in Washington. So I'm just gonna play that just to give you an idea of sort of um, what, what covering DC is like. Oops. Goal out of college was a fairly simple one. Well, let's maybe we can turn that down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. How's that? Which was to make my goal out of college was a fairly simple one, which was to make a living as a photographer. important thing for me with photography was people and moments and um, that really started to draw me to photojournalism. to be as inobtrusive as possible. Your presence influences what happens in front of you, and one of my goals is to be as unobtrusive as possible, to let real things happen in front of me. Growing up, the Washington Post was my hometown newspaper. That was the paper that was slapped on the kitchen table when I was eating cereal in the morning, and I would see those photos, so that was my goal in, in those years. I wanted to be at the Washington Post. I used to shoot an assignment, and if the Washington Post was there, the next day I would come to the paper and see their photographs. And you know, for those first few years, I would see their photographs and go, oh my god, how did they get that? I was right there with them, and just be blown away by the quality of their work. As the years went on, I started to see their work and mine and say, hey, you know, these, these are pretty comparable images. I feel like I could have done that for the Washington Post. And um, looking back, I think I was probably 
ready to reach out to the Washington Post for a job or, or even to start freelancing with them a few years earlier than I did. I, I, was, it, I was scared. You're, it's scary to uh, try for your dream and be turned down. So I didn't want to be turned down. Um, so looking back, I think I probably could have reached out to them earlier. Coming into my role at the Associated Press is a little bit different than a newspaper photographer. We cover things for the entire world. Our photography has to be not only newsworthy and interesting visually, but it also has to provide content for everybody. An event that we cover here also has to be helpful for a newspaper in Israel or in London. One of the most important things we as photographers at the Associated Press do in Washington, D.C. is cover the president. We cover him more than any other news organization does. We staff the White House from 7 a.m. in the morning until 9.30 at night. We travel with him wherever he goes. There's always a photographer in case something happens or in case the president needs to address the nation. images that we create help educate the country as to what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And to create imagery that is interesting and educational at the same time is very rewarding. Today, everybody has a camera, right? Everybody has a camera on their iPhone. And that, along with the state that we're in with journalism, it's become harder and harder to make it as a photographer. But if you have that, if you have that drive, if you can create compelling, interesting, timely photography, it doesn't really matter what tools you're using. You can stand there with an iPhone and make better photos than the person next to you. And I think that's still possible today. I, I want to apologize for how cheesy the, uh, the drive and the shifting. It's a little cheesy. Um, so that's just, I mean, that's just sort of like a day or a day and a half um, um, in, in DC. Um, my, my interest in photography, um, like, uh, like I said on there, was, um, you know, I was an art photographer. And I realized that sort of, you know, finding people and moments um, that were real as opposed to, you know, staged, um, had more um, significance to me. And um, it, it, it led me down that, that path towards um, journalism. Um, I, I didn't immediately find a, um, an amazing job right out of school. I, it was something that um, took many years. And, and uh, you know, I worked myself, for, I started in a, in a photo developing studio and um, started shooting local um, sports, you know, high school sports, and, um, and then got a job with a, with a local newspaper. And, um, you know, it was great. It was, a, it was a small newspaper, but it allowed me to cover, um, you know, big events from time to time, but, um, you know, definitely shooting multiple assignments every day, honing my skills, becoming a better portrait photographer, looking for moments. Um, and uh, from there, I just uh, worked my way up through um, basically every newspaper in Washington, D.C. And um, the um, Washington Post um, um, hired me for a, a, for a short-term contract, and, and um, shortly thereafter, um, the Associated Press offered me a job. 
So that was sort of a transition from a daily newspaper where I was shooting basically everything, protests, portraits, breaking news, food reviews, uh, parades, local high school sports. Um, and, you know, and, and from time to time we would, we would, you know, photograph Kevin Durant in high school or uh, Christopher Hitchens um, before he died. But, you know, you're, you're basically covering, you're covering the news. You're covering what happens um, in, uh, in local DC as well as, as, as national news. And that does include sports as well, although um, Julio will um, probably be able to, uh, to upstage me in that department these days. But, uh, but yeah, so that was, um, that was um, really, really my 13 years until I joined AP. Um, you know, covering, covering politics is, um, is, uh, has its unique challenges you are not only um, covering the story, but you're looking for a moment where somebody like a politician who is extremely guarded, natu you know, in front of the cameras, lets their guard down and makes, makes a, a, an expression that sums up um, a news story. Um, or you're looking for uh, just good light. Um, you know, politics is, a, a guy in a suit and tie and standing in front of a podium most of the time. And um, so you have to be creative um, with uh, basically almost the exact same moment on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is George H.W. Uh, Bush's funeral um, at the um, National Cathedral. And, you know, you, you, you try to have some, some artistic, um, you, you try to find something between art, artistic newsworthy and, and speed. You know, you, you, you still have to, um, these, these photos have to, have to move to the wire um, almost, almost instantaneously these days. Um, gone are the days of taking photos and, uh, and, and sending them to the dark room and having hours to, to sort of hone them and make sure they're perfect. Um, here's just the, the, the first time I went to the Oval Office. You can, you can tell who the nervous, uncomfortable, awkward kid is, feeling uh, overwhelmed and out of place. Um, and then, you know, the, uh, the, the thing in Washington is, uh, is you, your competition is right next to you. Um, the, your, your competitors are shoulder to shoulder to you, sometimes literally. And you're, you're basically, your office is wherever you are. So, um, you know, it's pretty, pretty standard practice to have two cameras at least, uh, a laptop and a backpack, um, and, and your phone. And um, lots of, we set up lots of remotes. Um, you know, there's some places that, that um, cameras can be distracting, or you're just trying to find a, a, unique, um, a, a unique angle. Obviously, it can be, you can always have too much gear, but... Um, but, but you know you, you try to make you try to make something interesting. This is the AP staff in Washington. Um, I'm still the the youngest one at 40 years old. So uh, uh, there's there's um, it, an enormous amount of experience in this in this photo uh, that uh, I've been trying to keep up with. Uh, here's an example of a of a scrum on Capitol Hill. This is Mark Zuckerberg, and uh, here I am trying to. Uh, trying to find something interesting or different from the person uh, to my left and right. So it, it can be a lot. And here's just a, a unique photo um, uh, held above, above everybody to sort of show just how many photographers are trying to get something more interesting than your, your, your photo. Um, and, and oftentimes, you, you end up getting in other people's photos when you're trying to do something. Um, so it's a unique um, challenge to, uh, to, to, um, to, to overcome. Uh, we travel with, with um, the president wherever he goes. There's always a photographer with the Associated Press, um, and that includes foreign countries. We, tra we travel with the Secretary of State, um, and lots of, 
strange behind the scenes things happen when you're uh, in, um, in a country in, in Africa or, or wherever. Um, we also cover, um, we travel for um, presidential elections. And um, you know, every, you go to uh, a speech every day, maybe two, maybe three speeches, and you're trying to find something interesting because again, a politician is going to come up to the microphone and give their speech. And um, you know, this, this day was Halloween, so I, I, I got Hillary Clinton between two pumpkins. You know, you, you got to make do with what, with what they put in front of you. Um, and um, like I said, gone are the days of film. You're sending um, instantaneously. So this was uh, election day with Hillary Clinton. And uh, I was on my laptop after I took a few photos to make sure that they had something for the wire. Um, again, you, you, do, it, you don't always look uh, cool doing this, uh, for sure. Um, it, can be, it can be frustrating just trying to find a position. Um, <laughs> as you can see. And yeah, there's just challenges all the time with the internet, with uh, travel, trying to get somewhere uh, w when, when news is breaking. Um, but again, this is, uh, this is in 2016, we, the, Hillary Clinton didn't want to travel in the same airplane with us, so they uh, got a private jet for all the press. So uh, that was fun. <laughs> um, but again, it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, uh, you know, this is all before COVID, obviously, but you know, this is, this is what we see when Hillary Clinton comes back to, or any, any politician comes back to, to speak to the press on, on their campaign plane, and, and we are, you know, packed in there. Um, you know, this is, this is a daily, occurrence, just, just being totally packed in. And um, sometimes you become the photograph yourself. And this is a Secret Service agent who went to the bathroom and, uh, and, and got caught, um, <laughs> caught uh, trying to get back to a seat. He had to wait for the whole, for the whole press conference to end. Um, but we try to have fun. I mean, uh, you know, these are long days. 16-hour days, 20-hour days, on the road, away from your friends, away from your family. And um, so we try to have fun. This is on Hillary Clinton's campaign plane. This is, um, this is a, a, a tradition. You, uh, the, the, the press sits in the back of the plane, and the tradition is you write a question on an orange, and if we, you can roll it all the way up to their seat in the front, then they're supposed to have, they have to come back and answer the question. So we, uh, we did this for a while. So then, and, and you know, eating and eating and sleeping become an, become an issue. I'll just show you a couple sort of behind the scenes um, um, videos of sort of moving around with the president. This is with Trump in um, Asia. This is a, Asia, a trip to Asia that we took. Yeah. So here we go, we're getting on the plane. Plane lifts off. The president's helicopter, he always flies separately and this is sort of uh, press and White House staff. A lot of, a lot of um, and, and a lot of times you end up having to sort of file, send pictures while you're, while you're moving around. So you're constantly moving your laptop out and putting it away. You rush in, they r rush you in. You take a, a quick, what's called a photo spray and you're, you're there for sometimes just a matter of seconds and they escort you right out. Um, so this is just sort of more, and then, you're, and then we're back on the plane going to the next spot. Um, this is the press secretary under, for Trump here on our plane, and and then um, we're you know we, we spend a lot of time in a, in a motorcade. The president's car is, is up ahead of us there. There's uh, Marine One and there's Air Force One, and you know you land, you're you're on the you got to run up to the plane, and. Um, and then, you know, you, you never know when the president's going to come back and, and speak to the press. 
So this is aboard Air Force One. And um, Trump would come back all the time. And so he would just speak to you guys, to the press and and head back. And you know, you you're taking pictures this whole time to try to make something interesting. There's Doug Mills with the New York Times, covered six presidents. And then you you know, sometimes your your photos end up in the newspaper the next day. So but again, we try to have fun. We try not to uh, be too serious all the time. There's a lot of waiting. <laughs> so, um, and I have a whole gallery on sleeping. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, the hours can be brutal. You're on your feet or you're in a van in, you know, all over the world waiting. It's a, it, the, the mantra with photographers is it's, it's, it's a lot of hurry up and wait. So you're, you're basically, you, they want you to run up and, and go somewhere and then wait. So uh, you get your rest where you can and, and uh, your colleagues take your, your colleagues take photos of you uh, while you're asleep. I mean, I, got, I have hundreds of these. I can keep on and on and on. Um, I'll just go through, you know, um, I think, um, especially with students, you know, they, everybody really sees the final product. I think it's, inter I think it's important to sort of show the process of just uh, one portrait shoot. Um, Early in Trump's presidency, he um, he gave the Associated Press an interview at the in the Oval, and um, they said that we could take photos. And so, you know, you have 15 minutes maybe for an interview, and and you reserve the, you know a minute or two for a quick portrait at, at the end. And so, um, you know, no, knowing that I was going into the Oval, I I looked at what other um, sort of portrait type photos had had been taken in there. So, you know, this is JFK. Um, you know, I just looked at the internet, searched the internet, and thought about what I wanted to do. And uh, at the end, of the end of the interview, this is with an interview with um, Julie Pace, who uh, now um, runs the entire AP in, in New York. Um, they brought me in at the last minute. And, um, you know, so I, she was finishing up her questions, and I, I took some pictures of the two of them. And then, you know, I made, I made some portraits of them talking. I was able to sort of get him, him talking. And then I had a minute. So I quickly, you know, we, I, 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 I asked for a couple different ideas, and, and they were willing to, to grant them to me. Um, and I told, I told an aide to turn the lights off in the oval. Here, here's the, port, the portrait being taken. I told the um, aide to turn the lights off, and it made for a more compelling picture. And initially, you know, Donald Trump, he's been doing this for 40 plus years. He's very image aware. Uh, I mean, he knows what he likes and he knows what he doesn't. So knowing that, he said, what are you doing? I don't want the back of my head photographed because he was concerned about his hair. So I said, no, no, sir, I, you know, I, um, this is kind of what I was looking for, this silhouette. And I showed him a picture that I had ready on my phone. And he said, oh, OK, that's fine. So um, he let me take this. And um, then um, I moved around, the, moved around the room, made some sort of more moody photos with the lights off. And I, I, went, I was shooting low on him. Also, again, Im image conscious. He, did, he was worried about being shot up and his chin. So he's, this is actually him telling me to stand back up. He wouldn't tell me why, but I knew why. Um, so, and then Jared came in to show him a paper, and I made a portrait there, uh, sort of behind the scenes picture. And um, then he said, OK, that's it. And I said, oh, sir, I, uh, we had discussed going out to the colonnade. So he said, OK, let's go out. So I made a picture of him walking out couple pictures of him walking towards me. Here's, here's um, Julie took a couple pictures of the, of the portrait. And that was, that was it. And that was the, the picture that was run 
um, you know, the, the next day. And then actually Alec Baldwin copied the, uh, the picture. <laughs> so there you go. So, and I just want to just note the timestamp on this. From, from the last picture to the first picture was exactly four minutes. And so you really have to move quickly. And four minutes is a lot. So you're really thinking about speed. You're thinking about as many pictures as you can make, many different pictures um, in, in a really limited amount of time. Um, the, um, what I've noticed is that as you, become, as you go higher up, you, the, that's the less sort of access and time you get. Um, I don't want to take too much um, um, more time, so I'm just going to skip to um, January 6th and just talk about my experience with January 6th, and then I'll have Julio come in. I was on the inside of the building, and Julio was on the outside. Um, my day began just like every other, a, a very normal day in Washington. Um, Washington, D.C. is where the entire country comes to um, have their voices heard. So um, having, having a protest in D.C. is not anything unusual. There's protests in front of the White House, in, on Capitol Hill, on the National Mall. Um, and um, I had quite a large role um, for the Biden's inauguration, which was just a few uh, weeks away. So they just said, we, just cover what's ha what happens inside, in the House chamber, um, the certification of the election. And um, so, so I, I plan on having a very sort of normal day, photographing politicians. And uh, a couple hours later, I was sort of in a, in a little office space off of the House chamber. I got a call from one of my editors who said, hey, um, things are getting kind of unruly on the east front. Would you mind just grabbing a camera and um, going to the window? So he said, I don't want you to go outside. I don't want you to get, um, not be able to come back. So I went out and I found this old, huge window, which is actually in a men's room. The US Capitol has, been, um, ha has gone through so many changes over the years. This was a big uh, window in the men's room. Uh, and so almost as soon as I got there, I could see this sort of police line. And it was just five or six police officers trying to hold this group of, at bay. And, um, and really within a minute or two of me being here, they broke through and I could hear windows breaking below me. I couldn't see down below. And I could hear um, sort of flashbangs from the police and smoke rising. So I went downstairs and these are the main doors to the rotunda, which is basically the center of the Capitol. It's the one where you, know, you, you look up and there's this, uh, this huge, um, beautiful paintings on the, on the ceiling. And um, these doors never open. Uh, they always remain closed. And um, an, an officer came up and grabbed me by the lapel and said, you know, what are you doing here? Get out of here. The building is on lockdown. And you know, I've been in D.C. for 20 years. And I, I just said, you know, this guy's overreacting. All right, I'll go back to my office. And, um, and I got back. And the door was locked. Nobody was there. Police officer yelled at me again, you know, what are you doing in the hallway? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know what, I'm, just, I'm just trying to go back to my office. So they grabbed me and they actually put me back into the house chamber, which is um, quite unusual. The photographers are only allowed in there a couple times a year. And suddenly I was shoulder to shoulder with members of the um, Congress. I was on the house gallery level, which is on the, on the floor above the, the, the house floor. And because of COVID, there were uh, members of Congress up there. Everybody was spread out. And so suddenly I was being told to shelter in place and, and you know, keep my head down. And this is the members of the media who were across the hall. Um, and they started evacuating people and there was lots of confusion. These are all members of Congress who I was, who I was um, you know, with up there. And the doors to the chamber were locked and we were kept in there because they didn't know if the hallway was secure or not. And eventually, they secured the hallways around, the, around us and started evacuating us. Um, this was one of the last photos I took as I left. Um, and this is what we found as soon as we came out into the hallway. Um, people who had gained entry to the building illegally um, down at gunpoint. And they took us out of the building. And uh, we were, 
remained in um, a House office building for hours. And eventually, they still had to certify the election for Joe Biden. So they, after hours, the, the Congress returned to finish their work, and they allowed a, a limited amount of press to come back. Um, and I walked around taking pictures. And this is a Congress, young congressman from New Jersey, Andy Kim. I didn't know he was a congressman at the time. He was just quietly cleaning up debris um, from the building. And um, you know, those photos really went really went far and wide after the fact. Um, um, and, and actually, the Smithsonian uh, asked to have his suit um, donated, um, the suit that he wore. But um, a really chaotic day, even from inside. Um, and um, I think I'll end it there. And I'll let Julio come up and talk, to, talk about his experience outside. Everybody hear me okay? All right, so um, being that uh, we're in Kentucky and it's an a AP tradition for, uh, for staffers uh, across the world, uh, you know, the, I want to give a big uh, toast to, uh, to Ed, Ed Ranke. Um, he was uh, our staff photographer in Kentucky for a long time and um, uh, passed away on, on the job uh, in 2012, I believe, 2011, 2012. But uh, I never met him. Uh, but every time I, uh, I went to any big assignments, uh, we all, you know, after being done with our, uh, our duties, uh, you know, we always find uh, where the nearest and open bar is. So, uh, so we always uh, toast to, to Ed, so uh, to Ed. I want to show you some some of my work, but uh, I just want to piggyback off uh, what uh, what Andy was showing us here because um, I think it's uh, you know this is this is my view from from outside of the um, uh, the Capitol, and and what's really special about my view is um, I was working. Uh, alongside uh, a, a teammate, uh, John Minkillo, who uh, uh, he was a staff photographer here in Cincinnati, or across the, the river in Cincinnati, uh, for a few years before going back to, to New York City, where he's from. And, and we worked uh, pretty well together. Um, we, we did the uh, uh, George Floyd uh, protest in, in Minneapolis and, and ran basically all over uh, New York City uh, for, for many years. So. Uh, he got attacked uh, by the mob, and, and this is uh, my video from my helmet cam. Yeah, we're just trying to get the audio on there. Uh, it's really important to hear the audio because you can hear uh, exactly what we heard, and, and not just for uh, the minute and a half or however long this video is. Uh, we heard uh, a lot of this uh, uh, commentary and, 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 uh, and, and um, threats uh, for many hours, uh, I would say 10 hours of, of constantly listening to people uh, telling us exactly what they wanted to do with, with, with our lives, which was uh, not, not exactly fun.
So, um, you know, the, this, the, the main thing about this situation is uh, it took us out of position because uh, uh, these two gentlemen that pushed us back uh, away from the danger uh, really got us kind of quite a bit uh, away from, from where we were uh, supposed to be. Uh, so uh, as a result, we missed a chance to go in uh, with the, the protesters into the building. Uh, we tried to uh, go around and, and change our, our, our location, but uh, the, there were so many people in front of us trying to get through the doors that we never uh, really got a chance to, to see a door. Uh, and we went on the east side of the, the Capitol, went up, it's, it's, it's a good 25 steps, concrete steps up to the, to the entrance. And, and when we got to the very top, uh, an elderly woman uh, told uh, uh, John, um, asked him, why are you pushing your way to the front? We're all waiting. And he just uh, calmly said, you know, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to push. And she noticed the AP on, on, on his, uh, uh, on his credential and, and was like, oh, it's, it's the effing AP, uh, throw him down the stairs. And they almost did, but he was able to calm down, uh, calm them down and we, we had to retract again. So, uh, uh, but we did our job. Our job really was, uh, you know, uh, for lack of better words, we were the knuckleheads to, to cover, uh, you know, the outside of, of, this, uh, of this protest uh, outside of the building we had. Uh, a total of nine people covering the um, uh, everything in Washington that day. So uh, we didn't really need to be inside. Andy and everybody else that was inside uh, did their job. So, so I, you know, at least uh, we were able to get the whole uh, story, which is really our, our main point is uh, why did we want to go inside is so that we can give more angles to the viewers uh, to show the world exactly what was going on. And we did it uh, as a team, so uh, that was uh, very cool. Um, this video, uh, just for uh, purposes of, of thinking about safety and, and training, uh, you, you look at it and, and immediately after he gets pulled down, uh, I know I cannot follow. Uh, growing up in Southern California and going to the beach, I know how rip currents work and rip tides. And so you know that if, uh, if your buddy is swimming and can't get out, you know you can't go in after it because uh, you will get sucked in too. So that mentality uh, kind of came into play uh, almost spontaneously. Um, and I decided to kind of go around um, and, and try to uh, ne never you know, approach the, uh, the attackers uh, face to face, which is not really uh, something you want to do. But I just didn't want them to, to uh, acknowledge me as, uh, as also a member of the press. So I, I jumped in kind of between, put my body between them and, and John. And, and I had succeeded for, for a second, but then somebody said he was in TIFA and threw him over the, the, that ledge there, uh, which uh, I think it was, uh, it was a, a really good thing, even though he, he got hurt a little bit, but that kind of uh, put a barrier between the attackers and, and him. Um, and we got through the day. I, I was really uh, scared. We talked to some students uh, here this morning uh, who were asking if we ever questioned, uh, you know, our jobs, you know, f whether it's safety or 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 just challenging. And, and I, I, as I'm walking here uh, in this moment, uh, I'm thinking, I'm done. This this is not for me. Uh, I, I got I got to find something else to do. I'm gonna stick to sports, uh, but but the, the day ended and, and I saw the coverage as a whole and, and I realized this is history. Uh, a little bit of background of my of my uh, career as a journalist. Uh, I've always wanted to be a journalist since I was 12 years old. Uh, my dream was to be uh, a professional baseball player but I, I needed to have a backup plan. And, and so um, journalism was gonna be my, my chance to get on the field either way. Um, and and the, the, the path to getting a job at AP or even getting uh, a college education wasn't easy. I spent uh, seven years at a community college, which sounds really absurd. It sounds like I party a lot, but um, I was undocumented when I came to the States uh, as a 10 year old. And so uh, it took me 13 years to get uh, uh, official residency papers. Uh, and I did have, when I graduated high school, I did have a work permit. I can work part time, uh, and, which I did at, a, at the LA Daily News as a writer. Um, but 
because I was uh, not uh, a resident, the, all the universities uh, wouldn't take me uh, uh, as an in-state tuition. I, I was out of state and I couldn't afford it. It was just uh, it was really silly to do a, 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 a state university at Harvard prices. Just uh, didn't, didn't make sense. So I just stood uh, in, at the junior college level doing that, uh, just taking classes, keeping the, 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 the juices going until I got my, resi my residency in 2003. Uh, two weeks after getting my residency, I enrolled at my uh, local state school. I graduated from there. Uh, I, I want to show uh, what it was like for me on, on my graduation day, because uh, uh, this, uh, this is what I wore on my graduation day. And uh, it's a big old neon sign that you can see from a mile away. And, and, and uh, just for, for a little reference, um, I, I'm, I'm, well, I'll just play it and then I'll explain it. So at the end, uh, after he read my name and reached over for the next person's paper, I, I saw the perfect opportunity to re reach over the, the microphone and say, uh, essentially, the, the immigrant national anthem, which is, si se puede, yes, it can be done. Uh, so that was a really, really cool thing to do. I, I, I thought I was going to get kicked off and not given my, uh, my degree. Uh, and, uh, but, but I just wanted to show you know, that, that it's possible. It, it took me nine years to get there, but, uh, but I finally walked that stage. Um, so with that, I do want to show uh, a clip of my work. It's not going to be too long.
So that's just uh, so. <laughs> just a, a collection of, of you know what it's like to be a, a, a photographer. Um, some of that is uh, when I was a, a, a newspaper photographer. I, I started my career. Uh, after doing an AP internship, I, I, they didn't have a job for me because I wasn't good enough. So I went and worked uh, uh, 15 months at, in Vero Beach at the Press Journal. Um, and then from then, uh, I went, went to Houston, worked at the Houston Chronicle for three and a half years. Uh, and finally, uh, I was okay enough to come to, to AP. Uh, so I've been at AP 11 years, and, and someday I'll, I'll be good enough to be at AP you know, I, I'll consider myself good enough because I still uh, don't think I'm there. Um, I, I, I love seeing uh, Andy's uh, run through of, of the four minute por uh, portrait because I want to show you, uh, you know, people talk about the picture uh, that they came across, uh, you know, the wire uh, just after midnight on, uh, on uh, May 29, uh, 2020. And Kim, uh, I sent uh, my images from the back of my camera. So just make a quick look at, at the ones that were usable and send them straight from the camera to her computer. Uh, and, and she was up. She, she stayed up with us every night until we were done. Um, and I, I sent her this picture. And I said, hey, uh, I just want to make sure you, you're, you're still up because uh, I think we got a good one. Uh, and sh of course, she responded right away. She was like, uh, thank you. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, wow. OK, cool. Thank you. Uh, so she, she, put it, uh, she put this picture up on the wire. Um, and it just echoed across the world instantly, which is, was so surreal for me. Uh, normally, uh, at, at difficult events, uh, scary events, I don't tell my family, uh, my parents, where I'm going. I just uh, usually. I, I call them after the fact and say, hey, guess what? Uh, I just uh, went skydiving for the third time. And, and so uh, this is kind of like my, my way of, of how I handle my parents. Uh, you know, I don't want them to worry about me. But uh, I, I got to Minneapolis uh, at 3 PM that day. And then by uh, 1158, uh, I'm sorry, 1159 with 38 seconds, this image was made. Uh, so it's kind of symbolic as well that it was uh, just, uh, you know, uh, the break of a new day, uh, which kind of uh, feels super, like, special to me that, that it was, uh, it has that symbolism. But uh, I went to sleep at 3 um, and woke up at 7 in the morning ready for another, uh, another day and uh, popped open my social media. And people all over the world were already tagging me uh, on, on all kinds of social media platforms with this image, so I, I thought, well, I, now I got to call my parents and tell them, uh, you know, you're going to see some pictures. Uh, I'm fine. Uh, and, but this image, like I said, uh, it, it's, it's, it looks like, all right, I, I'm good, but I'm not. Because I'll show you the behind the scenes. All these images are raw. They're, they're untouched images from, from that day. And with these images, I, I was just kind of taking a breather. The, we had just gotten some, uh, a message uh, from, from Kim and uh, other people on the ground. Uh, Carlos Gonzalez, he's a staff photographer at the Minneapolis Star Tribune, who was texting me and said, hey, we're getting word that there's a, a gas line that had just got severed. We need to get out of here. This place is going to blow. Back off, back off. So I backed off a little bit, um, enough to just kind of gather my thoughts. And then I saw this gentleman walking with the flag upside down. Uh, and I knew uh, the symbolism of, of the flag uh, upside down, so I started chasing them. And, and as I'm taking pictures, I'm, I'm trying to set the camera uh, settings so that I can get the right silhouette, because that was my goal. I wanted to get the, 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 uh, the flag lined up. And then it just happened, uh, you know, and it's just a split second it happened, and then it was gone. Uh, and and like, like I said, these are untouched images. These are just the way uh, the camera uh, had them. So I follow them a little bit. This is uh, closer to uh, where the people were gathered, uh, closer to where we believe the gas line had been severed. 
And, and so I, I photographed him for a little longer, and then I, I, I ran back because uh, I, I really was worried about my, my personal safety. Um, so unfortunately, uh, I tried looking for him to get his name, but I, I just couldn't, couldn't find him. So, um, uh, you know, I'm hoping someday, uh, you know, he, he'll turn up because I, I really want to, you know, say thanks for, for being the subject that, you know, uh, of, a, of a picture that many people uh, strongly connected with. Uh, and, and that's really it um, uh, as far as uh, the images I want to show. Uh, and, and I think uh, my time is better spent uh, answering your questions. We're going to uh, bring Andrew and uh, Julio uh, up to the front, and uh, Kim will join us uh, from Chicago. And we have a, uh, I'm going to start with a question that came to us uh, from the virtual audience. That uh, Andrew, it's addressed to you, but I think everybody could answer it, and that is, has to do with the balance of art and reality. You're a photojournalist, and yet there is an art to the photos. Uh, uh, Julio, the picture that you just showed us, I think, would stand as a, a piece of art, but it's also a piece of journalism. So uh, the question uh, from the audience, uh, from the virtual audience, is: How do you strike that balance between art and journalism? You want me to take that? Yeah. I, I mean, that's a that's an issue that uh, we struggle with every single day, you're kind of wearing, you're kind of doing multiple things. You're, you're trying to be artistic as a artistic photographer. You're also trying to tell a story and, and bring uh, an extra layer of, of news to a, a story. And you're, you're also, uh, you know, you have to know how to work the cameras and connect to the internet and send them. So it's a, it, it uh, you know, you, you get to use a lot of different parts of your brain, which is fun and challenging. And you know, the, I, for me, I think the, the easiest part is pushing the button. Um, it's you know, thinking about, well, how is this story going to be better served visually? Where can I be? You have to anticipate what's going to happen before it happens so that you're there. And try to make something interesting or beautiful, if you can. And, um, and sort of add something more to uh, a new story, and then time, it, making it a, a timely thing, being able to deliver it as fast as possible. And even in my career, that's become faster and faster. Um, you know, we can send a high-res image f directly from our camera with a, with a caption already loaded into it to make it easier for somebody like Kim on the receiving end. And I should mention, um, if I could, how important it is to have good editors behind us um, helping us know what's happening, where to be, um, uh, correcting mistakes that we've made, both in the, in the, in the little cut lines and, and, and with, the, with the pictures. Um, you know, oftentimes we, we don't have time to make everything perfect, and without them, uh, we, could, we really couldn't do our jobs. I don't, I don't know if Julio wants to add to that, but. Yeah, uh, well, you know, going off the, the beauty and the pretty pictures uh, of, of the world, uh, you know, we're not trying to uh, sugarcoat anything with, uh, with pretty pictures. If, if the situation is pretty, uh, it's just going to be pretty on its own. We just, uh, we're capturing that split second of beauty. Uh, and one thing to, to remember, is, uh, especially with, with the covering protest, uh, it's that uh, it's great to, you know, be up here talking about the pictures and it's great to, to get the awards and everything. But at the end of the day, we're, we're covering people's pain, we're covering people's suffering, uh, you know, their struggles. And so, uh, for lack of better words, that's just beautiful. You know, hum humanity is just beautiful, and, and so being able to have the luxury or, or the the uh, the privilege of being the one representing this big company across the world to to take that picture is really super special. So I feel that uh, my job uh, is not done until I've told the the, the story properly. Uh, truthfully, without any slants, without it, any touching of the images, uh, manipulating the, a situation, whether it's in, in, on the event or in post. 
Jim, we're going to try to bring you up if you would address that question also, the balance of art and journalism. Sure. Um, I, I, woo. It might have I gone to infinity with you guys too? Okay. Uh, that's fine with me though. Um, they pretty much covered it. I, I think the goal is to, you, you want it to be impactful because you want to grab, grab the attention of the viewers to tell the story. So a lot of times that is, even though it's a horrible situation, you, when you have that visceral aspect to it where it, it just, everything falls together. Um, I know I used to, I don't know if you know Sam Abel, but he used to be one of my favorite photographers because he would have layering where you're just telling story after story, it just grabs people. So there is definitely an artistic aspect to it, but that's the, like the highest goal. Sometimes you just go in and you have to shoot it. You know, you shoot it straight, and then after that you can start working it. But so much of what, I mean, I'd be going over the same ground as Andrew. If you're anticipating... Um, you know, where is the person going to go to next? When they walk in the room, where are they going to be? Are they left-handed? Are they right-handed? You know, what? who is that person over there? And Will they come over and meet them? So where should I be in order to be in a place to, to capture that moment when they come together? So these are all the things that you're thinking about when you're, you're making photographs because um, you just want to make, you know, to capture that moment. And then if you can capture it in a, in a well-composed way, that's that's even better. Um, I, I will add an extra layer now, uh, where we are now with technology, so many of our viewers are on screens just like this, and as you can see, it's a horizontal. A lot of times we, we're aiming to make that those first best images horizontal too, so that kind of like, uh, even if you want to turn the camera this way, sometimes you're, you do that and really quick, you need to make something horizontal too. That's the... Debbie Downer part, um, but yeah. Kim, if you'll, uh, this, uh, I'm going to give the next question to you, but I want to remind the in-person audience where we have a mic. So uh, as she wraps up her answer, just raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. But uh, we have a question from the virtual audience about where, uh, uh, having been impressed by seeing these images, where can they see them uh, again or and can they purchase them? Uh, so, uh, it's nice to see them tonight. How do I see them tomorrow? If you want to purchase them, bpimages.org is where we sell our photos. Um, and that you can be, they can be purchased for, licensed for editorial use and or purchased for personal use. <laughs> that's my, that's my, um, my commercial. I, th I read that too. I think it would be a great idea. And, you know, I, I'm just it's thrilled to see what Andrew and Julio presented here. It would be great to just to have some sort of presentation. It, would, it wouldn't surprise me if something like that what wasn't done. Um, you know, I certainly, I, I think I sent over like a TikTok of, of the night or the couple of days of how things transpired, but to show how the work is done, to show how the images come together, I, I think that would be, you know, either a some sort of um, seminar or uh, traveling presentation that for any, anyone who's interested. Julio and a Andrew, I know uh, when we were with the students, we went to an Instagram account. So could you just talk about that? Uh, that's one way to see some of this work. Yeah, definitely. Um, we uh, normally when we post uh, our work f that we shot for AP, we tag AP. So um, just go to the AP Images uh, Instagram account and 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 hit the uh, the tag button, and then you'll see everybody's photos uh, as uh, as a collection, which is a, a pretty quick and easy way to get them on your phone. Um, that that's probably the easiest and, and, and best. Hey, we're going to go to a question in the audience, and uh, by the way, uh, this row right here is one of the most dis uh, distinguished rows in the room of uh, some of the uh, real photographic photojournalism talent in uh, greater Cincinnati, So, and we're about to hear from uh, one member of the photojournalism press. <laughs> yeah, the one with the big mouth. Uh, 
Julio, I, if you could, could you talk about the crowds that you saw in Minneapolis and the crowd that you saw in Washington, and maybe a comparison and contrast, or how how it felt? Were you you know were you as afraid in Minneapolis or concerned as you were in D.C. that sort of thing? So. Uh Either uh, situation was very scary um, because our personal safety always came into play. Um, in, in Minneapolis, for example, uh, it was summer. Uh, it was a very, uh, very hot day, um, and you can't really conceal the, the bulletproof vest, mm -hmm. so you wear it on top of you. Uh, and then as the, uh, situations with the fire and all that, you're wearing your helmet and possibly your gas mask. And uh, and people are, are are pointing at you, saying uh, you're an arc, you're 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 uh, uh, you know infiltrating, and, and you know I just kept on, on showing my credentials, like no no see that picture that's me look, uh, this is a, a legit credential from the NYPD, um, so so that helped a little bit. Whereas uh, on January 6, uh, it was easier for me to just conceal my credential because. Um, then uh, people wouldn't uh, uh, question what, uh, who I was. Uh, you know, normally, in, in, in a protest, I dummy down my gear. So uh, with, with the Sony cameras that we have, we have a battery grip. I, 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 I get rid of the battery grip, so the camera looks a little bit more uh, amateurish. Uh, and I carry the least amount of, of things as possible that, that you know, label me as a pro. Uh, so, uh, I wore a brown, uh, a brown jacket and, and, and uh, gray pants, uh, and I seemed to be able to, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, mingle uh, with the with the crowd a little easier. But I still, all day, I heard, uh, you know, uh, we're gonna kill the press. We need to find, uh, you know, all the press and hang them, and, and you know, you just uh, hang your head and 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 keep going. Uh, but I, I, you know, even though. Uh, January 6th has been the most violent, uh, you know, event in, in my career. Uh, I've, I've also been attacked at, uh, you know, at, at three other uh, rallies, uh, uh, most of them in New Jersey when, when I worked there. Uh, and one of them, uh, a, a man uh, took a knife and, and swung it at me. And, and it wasn't, you know, it, it's, it's all kinds of demographics that are going to these, that, that are putting these events up. And so, uh, my the safety concern always comes into into play regardless if if I'm just doing uh, this group of people or that group. Another question from the audience, Julio. Uh, I guess for both of you, your capture from January 6 has that been used by the, the the committee? Julio, you were outside, and what we just saw there on your GoPro your helmet cam, uh, saw a lot of different faces. Your capture, is that, that been, yeah. that, been, that been used? Is oh, that being, it, being used it, presently? It has been used, uh, and uh, in fact, every time, I, I, to my knowledge, there's been four people in that video that have been uh, indicted, uh, and when you look at the, uh, the indictment papers, you actually see uh, uh, still frames from the video. Uh, and they're not just uh, getting arrested for that particular incident. They're, they're um, getting uh, uh, arrested for other things that they did outside and inside of the Capitol. Uh, it just so happens that with my video being so close and being a wide angle, they have a better view of their face. And some of them you can hear the voices. So there's, there's, there's even more of, a, of information that you know, really kind of points to that this is the person that was there. Andrew, if I could start with you on this question, and uh, because both of you showed slides of uh, uh, the multiple images taken before one, you know, and then the selection, but the question, uh, how do you uh, talk a little bit about the decision process of what you send for publication as you edit your photos on well, the slide? Well, I actually get in trouble a lot with my editors because I send too much. I, everything I take, I, oh, this is, this, this is, has to be on the wire. The wire is endless. Yes. I'm just going to say that. The wire is endless, but it has its <laughs> limitations as well. And uh, sometimes uh, I, I will be, uh, I, I'm what's termed a, a heavy filer. Um, you know, you have to use your judgment. Um, and, you know, 
the, the photo can quickly be replaced by a better photo just a minute or so later. So in the, in the, um, that, that has become, that is a, a, a new limitation with new technology is over filing. You know, you want to be, you want to get your photo out before your competitor and you want it out on the wire fast. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the best photo of the day. So you have to sort of make your own judgment and, um, you know, you end up uh, becoming a little, you're doing a little bit of self-editing. And um, so you're, you're sort of helping um, an editor like Kim, um, you know, because with digital cameras and the speed that we work at, we could, we could send thousands of images um, to Kim, which would probably uh, warrant a phone call from her. Kim, you're uh, on the receiving end of all the, all the excellent photos that should be on the wire. How do you uh, deal with that? Well, it's the same problem here because exactly as, as Andrew says, you, you want to be fast. So they will send something and I'll be, oh, this is great. And I'll put it out. And then like five minutes later, something else will come. And so then it, it's funny that you're saying that because then I start feeling kind of weird. Like, what are they going to think of my editing? Because I keep sending variations. Like, why didn't I pick the best one at first when, when that's not how it plays out? It plays out that it just gets better and better as you go along. So this is why I do adhere to the fact that the wire is endless. Um, and, you know, not, the, process, the processing is just once you've done it, it's there and, and we store it for archive that we could use later on. Um, it's just a matter of how frequent they're sending batches. If you have several people uh, sending at the same time, then it be can become a little bit unwieldy. Also, they will send you variations of the same thing, or they're way close to each other and it is, it looks like the same thing. So um, you just have to um, pick and choose. And sometimes if that other guy got in first and, it, and yours isn't appreciably better, it's not used. It's, we have what we call the archive and that's the AP images that I just referred you to. So, so much of that, that, that may not make the wire, but still is of quality. We'll, I'll put it over there and um, other people have a chance to go in. And a lot of times, um, some members who want to be a whole lot more competitive and who don't want to have the same image that everybody else has will go over to AP Images and, and find a different picture because they just want, want their page to look different. The other, just real quickly, the other thing is, is how newsworthy it is. If you're, I mean, the president is, I, I think, arguably the most important thing that AP covers. And when you're shooting the president, if you send a lot of photos, that's okay. But when you shoot um, the State Department's spokesman speaking and you send 30 images, you get a phone call. Why do, I don't know who this person is. Why, why are you doing this to me? So. I just want to add real quick with, uh, to that, that uh, we talked with the students this morning about it as well. Um, you know, you got to think, you're a photographer, you got to think as a writer. And if you're a writer, you got to think as a photographer and then also as a videographer. So uh, what's really cool in my, uh, my line of work is I, I have to edit other people's work uh, pretty often, especially uh, on Sunday night or Sunday football. Uh, I have to edit uh, a team of, of photographers covering that game. And, and so you, you, you kind of get used to seeing other people's work and seeing, all right, uh, how to edit better, which in turn makes me a, a, my, a, a better editor for my own stuff. Uh, and whereas I used to send 30 pictures of, of, you know, of something, now I send you know, 15 because that, that training helps. So that's a, that's a good uh, tip for, for students is uh, you, you got to try it all uh, because you will use it all. So um, I'm assuming you all have people in the Ukraine right now. How, how, are, how would you embed yourself in a situation like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I, we, know, we know photographers who are there right now. Um, um, 
I, I think you're best served by a photographer who has lived there, knows the language, and knows, knows a little bit about the um, country. And um, it's difficult to drop somebody in at the last minute as a war is breaking out and um, do your job without getting hurt. Um, there's a photographer, Brendan Hoffman, who was uh, in DC for, I don't know, 10 years and then moved to Ukraine in Kiev in Kiev, excuse me, and he was very, I mean, there's a lot of times he was struggling for work, and man, is he busy now. But um, he knows the language, and he also, he speaks Ukrainian and Russian, and you know, after he's been there for s seven, eight years, he knows Kiev, he knows the countryside. Um, you know, you're, you're, um, you have a, a a much better, you'd have a much better result both with your photography and f from staying safe. I just want to touch on the, uh, there might be a conception that, uh, a misconception that we uh, were made to do these assignments. And, and we work for a company that really cares about the, the staff. <clears throat> and if you feel like you're not quite fit to do that hurricane or to do that fire, uh, or, uh, you know, as Kim uh, said at the beginning, um, our staff photographer in Minneapolis was, was not capable to be out there uh, rolling uh, with the crowds at, at midnight. Um, it, that's okay. So uh, don't think that we're told you have to do this or else. Like, nobody that's in, uh, in uh, Ukraine or anywhere in the world is it's put there, uh, you know, against their will. Uh, it, it's really, they want to be there because that's what they uh, uh, they got in the, in the business to do. And, I, if and, I and there's training sorry. as well. Uh, yeah, that we, we send um, all all people that we send in the conflict, there's a training that we send them to. And, and what separates this one from our from the past couple of wars is there's not an opportunity to, to do an embed. Um, you know, all the other times we have been with the military in some, some fashion. So there's some sort of protection in that. But this war is, is completely unilateral. So it's, it's very important to have people who are experienced and, and not only have the training, but know, know the territory, as, as Andrew was saying. Um, so it's, it's, it's evolving, and we definitely had some volunteers, but we're, we're not going to put somebody in an unsafe situation, even if they want to be there, if, if, it's, not, if not, it's not the right fit. And, and, and I, can I also just add, it, it, it's in, I mean, AP has an ex, a, a diverse staff, and um, that matters, knowing how to speak the language, um, you know, looking like your subjects, knowing not only geographically, um, you know, to have, to have that makes a difference. Julio has a great story about that on the border where you were talking about that this afternoon. Yeah, so uh, as an immigrant and, and being uh, a 10-year-old in, in a detention center, I, I can uh, very easily uh, relate to, to families uh, who are living that situation now. And, and last year, uh, in, a year ago in March, uh, I got sent down to the border to cover, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, the young miners coming uh, by themselves, and uh, I did my job, and it was time to come home, and I'm at the airport, and I run into this family, um, and and I'm just having a sandwich at the airport. I, we put in a lot of a lot of hours. There's probably if I got three hours of, of, of uh, sleep per night, that that was great. So I'm I'm just ready to come home, I'm, I'm in my sandwich, and I overhear a conversation behind me in Spanish. A, a man is asking this little boy, are you excited to learn English? Are you excited to go to school? And of course, that just like rung a bell, and I'm like, wait a minute. I, I looked over and I said, hey, um, were you in uh, one of the t detention centers uh, that just uh, got out? And, and she said, yep. So I dropped my sandwich, went over, talked to them. Uh, and explained to the uh, to the woman that I, you know, I'm a new news photographer. Gave her a card. She was completely not into it. She was like, "No, I don't want my picture taken. I, you know, just leave us alone." And then I pretty much got down on my knees at her level and I talked to her and I said, "Hey, um, you know, you where you are right now? That was my mother uh, in 1989, and, and your son." 
Uh, he's half the age I was, but everything that you just went through, I went through myself. Uh, and I told her, like, nobody ever told my story, which is okay, I'm completely okay by that, but I want to tell his story. I want people to know that he's been granted uh, asylum and, and there's, there's a happy ending towards, uh, to this story. So she, she said, all right. Uh, so she, it, it, I took, my plan was just to take pictures of them at the airport as they got on their first ever plane ride and then be the end of that. And, and then in talking to her more, found out that she was going to Baltimore where I was going on the same two flights. We had the same flight layover in Houston um, and, and just basically let me follow them all the way to Baltimore where she was met by her uh, 28-year-old brother who she hadn't seen uh, in 14 years. So uh, the, the family reunion was, was really special. Um, and none of that would have happened if I didn't overheard the Spanish uh, or that I leveled with them and said, look, I'm just like you. I want to tell your story because it's important. Thank you. Uh, we are uh, pretty much out of time. I'm sorry about that. It goes quickly, but I have a question. We'll end with a little bit of a fun question. Julio, this may very well be for you. Do photojournalists ever use a drone? Oh, yeah. Uh, that's the funny part about um, about uh, photography is, uh, you know, you got to put cameras where you can't be. Uh, my my editor uh, at the Houston Chronicle, Steve Gonzalez, uh, you know, uh, ingrained in me that you know he said, my my mother would love to be a Houston Chronicle photographer, but I, you know, you, I can't uh, give her a job because she's going to go to the assignment and then do this, click, 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 go home. Uh, so you're young, you got, you know. Uh, all the health in the world, you can climb on trees, you can get low, you can, you know, do everything possible to, to, to get a different angle. So with drones uh, becoming available and, and pretty affordable, uh, I've been using that a lot. You saw it on, on, on my slideshow there. I, uh, in fact, when I went back to the border the second time, we were so far away from seeing the, where the, uh, the Haitian migrants were encamped that we couldn't see it visually. Uh, from, with, with our eyes or with their cameras. So I spent most of my week uh, flying the drone just over them, um, shooting images that, uh, that really told uh, what was going on there. And, and on top of that, uh, the great video quality. We, we ran the video, we ran the photos. Um, uh, we heard that they were cleaning up. I, I got the call from an editor saying, hey, I think they're cleaning up. Uh, they're, they're almost uh, all gone. Uh, can you go check it out with your drone and, 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 and report back, and, and, and I did. So uh, it's, it's, it's a great tool. You gotta learn how to use it properly. There's a lot of uh, FAA rules that come into play, but if you follow the lines ethically uh, and properly, you're gonna get uh, a lot of good use out, out of drones. This is an example of how, you know, the AP's report uh, was dependent on Julio there he, he's a person who confirmed the whereabouts in all of these updates with the staff and um this is where all formats that where we we cross pollinate with information um it's not just you know one telling the other what to do and what and what the facts are um we we would have been dead in the water if julio would not have been down there with his drone we would have just had on the ground and we'd have been dependent on others or following others but he kept us ahead of the game kim if you uh don't mind for the uh as we uh last kind of reflection uh the first amendment that protects uh, uh freedom of speech there was uh there were no codecs or nikons or even iphones uh what are your reflections on the importance of photojournalism in a democracy? Well, it's, it, you can tell from the fact that people use their iPhones in so many ways that there's, there's so much truth and, and coming out because people raise up their phone and they make photos and they make videos of it. It's, I, I know it's kind of like flooded the zone, but we, we learn more, George Floyd, you know, nothing would have become of that if there hadn't have been somebody staying there with their phone. Um, right. So, so I just I think that we have advanced. I know the vitriol is greater, but um, 
there, uh, I, I w- I'm optimistic that that the truth still comes. It's it's just when it gets grabbed by others and, and then manipulated that we have problems. But for the most part, the accurate information's out there. We have so many ways of just as this was talking about with Julio of finding out what's going on because of the tools that we have. Um, and that's in spite of some of the efforts. I mean, we weren't able to see this because the, the U S government was keeping us from, from that area. Um, but, but we were able to work around because of the equipment that we have. And we're always looking to advance our abilities to, to keep, keep staying out there. And as I said, shine a light on things that are happening in the world. Thank you. And I would uh, uh, want a couple of things. I just want to say thank you to the uh, North Media, which is a student co-curricular activity. Uh, they've made this possible tonight technologically. And trust me, it wasn't as easy as they may make it look. Uh, but uh, uh, thanks to North Media. Part of the uh, experience tonight is uh, uh, a teaching moment for uh, the students at NKU. So uh, uh, I think they, they're pretty good learner. So let's give them a little applause. And uh, thank you uh, also to Kentucky Humanities, who uh, uh, is our, our co-sponsor tonight. Uh, and uh, you'll see, I think, a version of this on uh, their website. And also, there are more events uh, that they're having around the state, if you'd like to tune into those. Most of all, let's thank our AP photojournalist for being with us this evening. Good night, and thank you for coming. It's, uh, we're trying to be post-COVID, and uh, it's a process. So it's important that you came tonight. Thank you.